top stories tonight. The People's Democratic Party denies appointing Yayari Mohammed as acting national chairman. Bayelsa APC suspends Lopoburi Leon eight others over alleged anti-party activities. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, Vice President Shutima, console an NPC boss over daughter's death. Senegal's Constitutional Council clears Prime Minister Sonko to run in parliamentary elections. Thank you for joining us. I am Dakbo Adigboye. Let's begin with the leadership crisis in the People's Democratic Party. Nigeria's opposition, People's Democratic Party, has dismissed reports making the rounds that its treasurer, treasurer that's Yari Mohammed, has been appointed to replace its suspended national chairman, Omar Damagun. The party's newly appointed acting national publicity secretary made this known to newsmen at the party's national secretariat in Abuja, saying that only the National Working Committee of the party can make such pronouncements. News Central's Emmanuel Bagudu tells us more. To be innocent. The crisis in the People's Democratic Party has sure taken a turn for the worse following the suspension of the acting national chairman, Omar Ilya Damagun. As deputies, members of the National Executive Council replaced their superiors, their first press conference was to intimate citizens on events playing out in the party in a bid to set the record straight. I would want us to have a working relationship, a very cordial one, like you have had with my predecessor. He is not gone yet, he's only on suspension. Like Ms. Chinwe said, within the period of two weeks within which he would have interfaced with the committee chaired by His Excellency Taufi Garapaja, he would have exonerated himself of the allegations leveled against him. It was said to be um, uh, insubordination and disloyalty. Whatever that means, it will be cleared better in the days ahead as the committee meets with them. But I am here to report on duty, nature abhors vacuum. My humble self and my colleague seated right by my side have resumed in that capacity. I know you will agree with us that it's not important to give a day out. We are expected to resume almost immediately in line with the provision of the law and the directive of the National Working Committee. The acting spokesman denied the party's involvement in the appointment of the new acting national chairman as replacement for the suspended chairman, Ilya Damagun. He provided details of what led to the suspension of the party's executives, saying the crisis in the party, unfortunately, is heating up the nation's polity. I am sure you are guided by ethics of professional conduct and the rule of engagement. Uh, nobody will just wake up from the wrong side of their bed to begin to churn you know, narrative and then expect the enlightened members of the society to take it hook, line, and sinker. Uh, we are guided by rules of engagement. When Ms. Chinwe was making the background presentation, she did say at its 593rd session, the NWC sat in a formal quorum and gave the decision yesterday, suspending the duo. Now, I wouldn't know at what sitting, with what quorum, what number, who are the dignitaries, that would have come with that kind of narrative. What I would have expected from members of the pen, given your, you know, revered standing in the society, is not to even entertain that kind of uh, uh, argument coming from a people that uh, have decided to go against decorum, rule of engagement, and decency. The it's acting legal advisor of the party provided details of the legal implications of the current crisis in the party. The deputy national chairman not is from the north. That's the current uh, acting chairman, Damagu. So when the, the national chairman vacated office, so by the provisions of the constitution, he now assumed office as an acting chairman. And it, you, can, you cannot remove him. Like when people go and make statements, he has to act until he, either you elect a new chairman by a convention. You know the provision of the law. You have to elect a new chairman who now assume office for him to now vacate that uh, office. It has not been done. 
So people will now go and say the Babu must leave office. He has to uh, be removed from the office. It's not the way mm. because we are not in a lawless uh, society. The PDP says that it will respect the recent court decision which mandates the Magun to be replaced by a valid convention. In Abuja for New Central, I am Emmanuel Bagudu. Of course, in the meantime, the All Progressives Congress has suspended the Minister of State, Petroleum Resources, Heineken Lokobiri, and the party's 2019 governorship candidate in Bayelsa State, David Leon, for alleged anti-party activities. The suspension extends to the State Commissioner for Power, uh, Karim Kumoko, Commissioner for Lands and Survey, Pere Bewery, former APC State Chairman, Jathan Amos, an ex-official member of the National Executive Council, God bless, Jerewari, and Southern Ijo APC Youth Leader, Sabi Morgan. A party stakeholder and APC Chair, War 3, Southern Ijo Omebi Faobi, including all ward executive members as well as the APC Ward 4, Southern Ijo, Claudius, Odobu, and all the ward executive members. We are all suspended by the party. Governor Caleb Matwang of Plateau State has sworn in 15 members of the People's Democratic Party, who we are declared winners of the 9th of October 2024 local government chairmanship election in the state. After administering the oath of office, the governor urged them not to betray the trust of the people of Plateau, uh, placed in them, but to work together for the advancement of the state. Now, New Central's Chizoba Anyonwe tells us more. Accreditation, voting, and collation of results took place and concluded on October 9 across the 17 local council areas of Plateau State. It was the first time such an election was held on a weekday. 24 hours later, the election results began to trickle I, in amid Daniel tight Chisha. security at the Plasiek head office. Officer, With I the announcement of winners in three separate batches of 10, 5 and 2, and it was time for them to take the oath of office officiated by Governor Caleb Mutwan. I am committed to making sure that the local government system not only remains, but becomes stronger and more effective. I therefore welcome you on board to join me in leading Plateau State to a new level. That together we will join hands and work for the benefit of our people. We are going to ensure that you have a peer review mechanism that challenges you to give your best. And I can assure the people of Plateau State that we are not going to allow the local governments to be shortchanged. Pledging to contribute to the development of the state from the grassroots was the newly sworn in chairman of Wase local government area who spoke on behalf of his colleagues. We continue to thank everybody within the state and call for peaceful coexistence within the 17 local government. And we pledge our allegiance to cooperate to give the state government the vital cooperation needed for us to move Plateau State forward. It was past 9 p.m. But the people of Plateau defied the time to show their support and solidarity. The returning officer for the 17 local government areas, Planji Chishak, expressed satisfaction with the outcome of the October 9 election and promised improvements in future polls. In Jaws for New Central, Chizoba Anyui. Kogi State Commissioner for Information, Kinsley Fanwo, said the current administration of Governor Usman Nududu is a cost-cutting one. In an exclusive chat with New Central Television today, he confirmed that frivolous purchases and allowances, particularly in regard to political appointees, have been scrapped. Appointed Commissioner um, in January this year, and uh, up till now, the governor has not given me an, an official vehicle. And he so told us, I don't have an official vehicle from this administration. And you know, he made it point clear that look, it is not going to be about the welfare of the people who have appointed to serve. It is going to be about the welfare of the people who have hired him with their votes to serve them. 
So that is one of the areas uh, in which you cut cost. Um, you, 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 you can imagine buying Prado Jeeps for 21 commissioners, for many director generals, many special advisors, many senior special assistants, many GMs, it runs into billions of Naira. So instead of putting that money there, he also described the relationship between the current governor and the immediate past governor, Yaya Bello, as cordial and law-abiding, despite allegations of fraud leveled against the latter by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Former governor of the state, um, I speak for the government of Kuge State, and um, what I will say is that the governor of the state is, um, is a law-abiding um, leader is someone who believes so much in the rule of law and um, constitutionalism. And even what happened and, you know, people got talking about it, you said you were looking for someone. And the governor said, oh, it's not a problem. And he drove him to that place and said, okay, this is the man that you said you want to, um, you want to see, you know? And they said, okay, he should go. That later they would, um, they would call him whenever they need him only for a few hours later to take um, rifles to the um, official residence of the governor. It's, that, place was, that place is not the residence of Yahya Bello. It is the residence of the governor of Kogi State. You took rifles there, surrounded the place, and started shooting sporadically. Um, you know, things should be done um, in accordance. All right, so let's take you back to a story we earlier told you about the leadership crisis within the People's Democratic Party. We are Nigeria's opposition. People's Democratic Party has dismissed reports making the rounds that its treasurer, Yayari Mohammed, has been appointed to replace its suspended national chairman, Umar Damago. Now, we also told you that the party's newly appointed acting national publicity secretary made this known to newsmen at the party's national secretariat in Abuja saying that only the National Working Committee of the party can make such pronouncements. Now, joining us on the news at this time to discuss this further is uh, Gide Ojo. Uh, he joins us uh, virtually. He's a political analyst. Thank you so much for your time, Gide Ojo. My pleasure, Dr. Good evening. Good evening. Now, let's get straight to it. I mean, interesting times uh, within the People's Democratic Party. Uh, I mean, just today... Even across social media, the likes of Dino Milaye seem to, uh, you know, be vocal about the exit of uh, Umar Damagum, you know, as the party's chairman. I'd like your take on what is going on within the PDP. Uh, it's, it leaves a sore test in the mouth that a party that governed Nigeria for 16 years will be immersed in this kind of leadership crisis. Um, since it left power in 2015, PDP has been a shadow of itself. And I should say, um, if care is not taken by 2027, if they continue along this trajectory, it will be the carcass of PDP that will be left to contest uh, in 2027. So go going by the genesis of what happened, um, Recall that it was Eyo Chahayu, Dr. Eyo Chahayu, that, me, that um, uh, you know, uh, saw the party through the last general election last year. And when they lost, uh, they heap all the blame on uh, Eyo Chahayu and eased him out, got his word in permission to suspend him and, you know, through the instrumentality of the court, uh, they eventually edged him out. And they asked him, uh, Ilya Damagun, uh, the vice president, not to act in his step. And more than a year after, uh, the, they have not had a convention. And it is the convention they will have replaced all the other officers of the party that have left. But unfortunately, three months ago, or about May, June, when they had the next meeting, they asked uh, Damagun to, to continue in that capacity as acting chairman, uh, pending when they will conclude all the party congresses from ward to local government to state. And in many states, they've done that. In fact, they have even set up a reconciliation committee. Only for us to hear yesterday that um, 
Uh, there is now suspension of Damago and uh, Senator uh, Aya, who is his national secretary. And the, the faction loyal to Damago has also suspended the national legal advisor and the national publicity secretary. But I want you to note that uh, these are just chess. Uh, in the chess board, in the chess board of PDP, they are actually not the dramatic personnel. Those who those who are drumming disaffection in PDP are, are, are not even the people who, are, who we are mentioning, because obviously the National Working Committee is divided. Uh, I don't want to mention names, but we know. Uh, if, if you've been very attentive, you know that there is one camp of the former presidential candidate and there is another camp of a former governor of a state. And that is what is playing out. And today, I mean, the instrumentality that, of the uh, court We've also tested. seen cases where some uh, members have been accused of anti-party activities, particularly in the area of working against the party in support of even the ruling party. So, I, I mean, looking at all of this play out, um, and maybe for some, seeing this as some sort of house cleaning, uh, how effective will this go? Unfortunately, it will be very difficult to wedge out those people that have come, that have been accused of antipathy. I recall, uh, you know, uh, Inyeson Wigge has been accused of antipathy, and he has gone to court to obtain an injunction that he should not be suspended, he should not be uh, sacked, he should not be dismissed from the party. And which is what Damago has also done today with the with the judgment from um, the Justice Peter Lifu, who has given him uh, an injunction that he should not be removed, he should not be sacked until the national, until his four-year term ends in 2025, uh, December 2025. And so, they, 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 are, they, are, they are now having the courts coming to their head. And unless you want to go against the ruling of the courts, that's when you continue along the trajectory that you have suspended. You could see that uh, a, new, a new national publicity secretary has been uh, appointed, and it's not the one communicating to the press. So uh, I think it's just the BOT has come out to say, let everybody shed their sword. Uh, let them have gone be let, why they feel why they resolve the issue. But like I said, the dramatic personnel are actually uh, not the one being mentioned. There is a proxy war. Uh, there is a faction loyal to a former governor that wants the magnet to stay for their own selfish interest, and there is a faction belonging to the former presidential candidate who also wants the magnet to go. And you could see that this is also linked to the developments in uh, River State, where some 27 lawmakers have been de have defected to the APC. And the position that Gamagun took and the position that other NWC member took is also part of the, uh, the old uh, you know, uh, issue that they have currently, which they need to resolve. But I hope the BOT, Board of Trustees, will be able to mediate in this whole crisis because this will be to the advantage of APC. If they don't do proper house cleaning and shed their sword and resolve their, their, their issue amicably, uh, they will just find out that many of their governors, many of their senators, House of Reps members, state assembly members, will just empty themselves into the APC. Mm. And that's why I expressed my earlier fear that if care is not taken, uh, it is the carcass of AP, uh, the carcass of PDP that will be alive to contest 2027 uh, uh, general elections. Because obviously, it, the, the crisis have lingered for about nine years now since they lost power in 2015. They have not known peace. Recall that after they lost power in 2015, they brought in uh, Senator Alimondi Sheriff of uh, former governor of Benu, Benu State, and, and then they want him out. He didn't want to go. They appointed the uh, uh, former governor of Kaduna State, uh, uh, Mekafi, to, to head the transition committee. And the whole thing became messy that it ended up at the Supreme Court right. before eventually 
uh, they were able to edge out uh, SARS. That's Senator Ali Modu Sherif. So now they, they, they seem to have patched things up in the lead up to 2023 election by bringing Dr. Yota But obviously, because of self interest and not obeying their own constitution in terms of uh, ensuring that the party, uh, the All presidential right. candidate and the party chairman does not come from the same geopolitical zone. That's part of what is plaguing the PDP. All right, Very unfortunate, you know. but I hope they are able to mediate and resolve their issue All right, uh, without you know. much litigation. Thank you so much for your time on the news. Uh, we deeply appreciate your insight. My pleasure. Always a pleasure. All right. Enjoy. Now, come... Great. Coming up on the news, uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, Vice President Kashim Shatima, console the NNPC boss over daughter's death. We'll bring you details after the break. Can you join us? If you have just joined us, you are watching tonight on New Central Television, a reminder of our top stories. The People's Democratic Party denies appointing Yayari Mohammed as acting national chairman. Bielsa APC suspends Lukbobiri Leon, eight others over alleged anti-party activities. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, Vice President Kashim Shetima, console NMPC boss over daughter's death. Senegal's Constitutional Council clears Prime Minister Sonko to run in parliamentary elections. Let's tell you that uh, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu and Vice President Kashim Shetima on Friday consoled the group Chief Executive Officer of the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, Mele Kiari, over the death of his daughter, Fatima Kiari. It was gathered that Kiari's daughter, Fatima, died Friday at the age of 25 after a protracted illness. The duo, in their separate messages on Friday, condoled with Kiari, who has been leading the NNPCL since 2019, a statement conveying Tinubu's condolence by his special advisor information and strategy, Bayo Nonuga, said that the president prayed for the repose of the soul of Fatima and urges the Kiari family to stay strong. Moving away from that, as the world marks the International Day of the Girl Child, the dream of young schoolgirls in Abia is to have a future that gives them equal opportunities to life with their male counterparts. Now, with the team Girls' vision for the future, the girl child understands that only her can project and hold herself down. New Central Studio Ogale reports that female school children in Abia State had a real opportunity to express themselves at an event to celebrate the girl child in Umaya, organized by the wife of the state governor, Miss Priscilla Oti. Is to have a bright future and be able to achieve her potential despite the situation in the nation. Over time, the girl child has proven to be daring, adventurous, and focused on her dreams and aspirations. The successes of several girls and women try to counter the cultural, religious and societal barriers that have held them down. Let their children grow and make choices for themselves. They shouldn't be forced into marriage or anything at all in life. They are trying, but there are so many barriers uh, blocking them. Financial barriers and cultural barriers. Because women are always expected to stay in the kitchen and not to lead. Financial barriers, they don't have enough money to send them to school. While efforts are made to change the narratives and families and the society in general about the girl child, that can only be achieved when the hurdles are surmounted in a society like ours. Today, we knew our commitment to building a world where our parents can try, dream and achieve greatness without
Priscilla Oti, wife of Governor of Abu State, encourages the girls to take their own destinies in their hands, assuring of state government's protection. To stress the importance of the girl child in the society. Maureen Ahokwa, Commissioner for Women Affairs, says there is need to help the girl child overcome stereotypes that have deterred her growth over the years. Well, the suppression in the society is what makes a girl look like she's the problem of herself. We need to let these girls evolve. We need to tell them who they are. We need to make them have self-esteem. We need to tell the girl child you're important. You know this thing about culture? where oh people celebrate the birth of a boy and then the girl is like hey i'm again i'm on one you know what i mean so we're here today to tell the girl child that even if you're the only child born in a family there's a future for you resource persons highlighted impediments to a girl's growth and urged the girls to remain resolute in their pursuit for a better life empowering the girl child with adequate education and giving her the liberty to make informed career choices not only instills confidence in her but helps her evolve and become a force to reckon with in omaha for new central chinwe ugili to discuss the significance of the day, we are joined by the founder of NAF Foundation, Nafisat Atiku. Thank you for your time, Nafisa. Thank you so much, Dr. for having me. Good All evening. Right. When we say girls in Nigeria should be given the right conditions to thrive contextually, now what does that mean and how important is that for them? Well, thank you so much for that question. You know, International Day for the Girl Child is usually one of my favorite days when it comes to celebrating women. Why? Because I believe that the empowerment that we seek for women, you know, politically, in leadership, economically, climate change, and in every other sphere, right, starts from empowering women, especially when they are young. And that's really been the focus of most of my work. So in terms of contextually, to answer your question, especially when we're talking about, you know, Nigeria as a nation, as a country, we need to first of all understand the challenges that exist towards um, before girls can, you know, explore their potential to become the women that they are destined to be as leaders in a globalized world. We, we talk about the impediments to, you know, education in terms of access to finance, to be able to go to school, um, conflict, banditry, you know, um, um, sexual reproductive health. We also talk about the issues of technology. We also talk about the issues of cultural norms and stereotypes, which, you know, in the clip that was just just shown from Abia State, we can see participants talking about how social norms and cultural stereotypes do, you know, restrict the potential of these young girls from believing that they can achieve, you know, everything that they set their mind to. It's more of like a social norms re-engineering project, right? Making sure that in society, that the different units that exist between the media, to the family, to the educational institutions, the government, to, you know, the religious institutions have the values and are also inculcating those values in our young women that they can believe, they can achieve, they can dream without any sense of limit and also support them and give them and the tools, especially technology, in order to you know maximize their future and maximize their potential. Because we all know that with the invent, um, with the basically um, MA and technology, we know that we're heading into another digitalized world, and it's important that we equip these young girls with, with the future to be able to own their um, to own their you know their aspirations. Mm. Now, what Thank would you consider the most pressing challenges faced by girls in Nigeria, and how do you feel these uh, challenges can be addressed? Wow. Is that just one critical challenge? 
I don't think so. But, you know, to answer your question, I will once more go back again to the issue of social norms and stereotypes. There are a lot of, I'll give you an example, a practical example, right? I wrote a book in 2019 called Girls Just Want to Run, and that was driven out of my own experience, you know, trying to get involved in politics as a young woman. And I remember being at a stand and, you know, putting my books for sale so that young women could come and read it. And there was a young lady, like around 16 ish, 15, 16, 17 maximum. And then she saw the book and she said, oh, that she doesn't think that she should be involved in politics because, you know, it's not something that she's exposed to, that she was told, you know, young women, women shouldn't belong in politics. That's a mindset, that's a that's a norm, that's a value that has been passed across to her by the society and the socialization that she's been exposed to. So there is a lot, so I would say in terms of the most critical challenge that we have right now in Nigeria that says an impediment to girls and their progression and the exploring their potential, are the beliefs that we have as a society that young girls should be sent to the kitchen and there are some careers that they should not pursue. Because you know what, that also affects our lawmakers when they are sitting down you know, in the legislative chamber and they are making laws and policies for our young girls with the perspective that these girls don't belong in leadership, they don't deserve to explore their potential. So that really needs to change. We as a country need to go through some sort of engineering of the stereotypes and the social norms that guide us to be able to make room for this limited boundless potential to flourish all right now tell us more about this year's theme and what you feel is the target so this year's theme i think for me and to my own best understanding and on the research that I have done is centering the voices and amplifying the voices of young girls in designing the interventions that they need. So, you know, it's her vision for the future. It's not our vision for the future. It's her vision. So it's giving them the opportunity and the platforms to voice out their concerns, to voice out their needs, to voice out their aspirations, and for the rest of us to put our hands together as allies, to provide the support systems, the tools, and the resources for them to be able to reach their potential and, you know, achieve their dreams. So I think beyond anything that we'll talk about here is that center the voices of young women and young girls in the interventions, initiatives that address them. Listen to them. Don't just put them in a cupboard and say they don't know what is good for them. Hear them out and be the support system, the tools and resources for them to be able to use because they can do a lot more than we give them credit for. That's my experience. All right, thank you so much for your time on the news, Nafisa Atiku. You're welcome, thank you. All right. Still ahead, Senegal's constitutional council clears Prime Minister Sonko to run in parliamentary elections. We have details of this and more after now. The news continues in West Africa, where Senegal's top constitutional body has cleared Prime Minister Osman Sonko to run in the upcoming parliamentary elections, rejecting an appeal by an opposition coalition that sought to block his candidacy. The Taku Walu Senegal coalition, led by former President Macky Sall, argued that Sonko was ineligible to run due to his June 2023 conviction in absentia, which sentenced him to two years in prison for corrupting youth. However, in a decision released late Thursday, the Constitutional Council dismissed the appeal as inadmissible. Senegal will head to the polls on November 17th to elect a new parliament, following President Basiru Duamoye Faye's decision to dissolve the opposition-led National Assembly in September. The three-day African Monetary and Economic Sovereignty Conference concluded today in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, with a focus on empowering the continent through economic self-determination. The event themed leveraging multipolarity economic options for Africa brought together a diverse groups of academics, policymakers, and thought leaders from across Africa and beyond to explore pathways to economic sovereignty. Now, New Central's business correspondent, Perpetual Fasumi Peter, was there 
and filed in this report. Economic sovereignty, U.S. hegemony, debt restructuring, domestic resource mobilization, climate change. These words and phrases have dominated conversations in the past two days. But as day three unfolds, the focus will be shifting to de-dollarization and pan-Africanism. But can Africa achieve this? Well, let's get into the meeting and hear what they have to say. My experience is the IFS exposed African country to recurring balance of payment crisis, debt crisis, which are, in my view, an inevitable outcome of the long-term deterioration of commodity terms of trade, the growth-crushing borrowing rate, and balance of payment constraint imposed by dollar funding. I want to ask an IMF colleague that what will happen to Italy if instead of paying 2% on their debt, they were paying 10% or 15% like an Afri like African country, his answer was clear, Africa will do, Italy will default. For Dr. Arauz, Africa must also pay attention to the global payment systems. Uh, payment systems are a crucial infrastructure of uh, uh, the global economy and, of course, national economies. Uh, but very few people know who are the players behind the global infrastructure of the payment systems. Uh, few people know, for example, that every time you use a credit card out of the two major companies, a copy of every transaction is stored in data centers in the United States that, because of the USA Patriot Act, it means that a U.S. government agency, sometimes those affiliated with the military, have access to all of those transactions. Having established that these structures jeopardize Africa's economic sovereignty, what then must the continent do? It is important to delink uh, the national payment systems, the regional payment systems, the African payment systems from those hegemonic players so that there can be more sovereignty, more possibility to not, not only improve the economic situation of uh, the people in Africa, but also to improve the sovereignty of the information related to the payment systems. In essence, Monetary integration has become the necessary conditions for effective sovereignty and development in Africa. It also has the potential to achieve, to accelerate implementation of the AFCFTA and will bring geopolitical power to the regions, the way the dollar has to the US. It's been over 20 hours of non-stop debate, deliberations, and conversations on how Africa can achieve economic sovereignty. This conference has featured the best minds, economists, professors, even thought leaders from Africa and around the world. However, those who are vested with the responsibility of turning these conversations into policies are not here. Well, it is my hope that when the communique gets to them, they'll do the needful. In Addis Ababa, for New Central, I am Perpetua Fasome Peter. Let's join our business desk for the rest of today's business news. Business news in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. Nigeria has advanced its efforts to capitalize on its vast gas reserves by signing a deal with joint venture partners to support gas to a proposed $3.5 billion brass fertilizer and petrochemical plant. The agreement involving Shell, Total Energies and ENI will provide an estimated 270 million standard cubic feet of gas per day to the plants located in Bayelsa State. Nicholas Agbeela, permanent secretary of the Petroleum Ministry noted that the project is expected to generate at least $1.5 billion annually from exports of petrochemicals and other gas products. As Africa's leading energy producer, Nigeria aims to develop its over 200 trillion cubic feet of gas reserves, boosting exports and industrial supply while ending routine flaring by the year 2030. Meanwhile, Tigran Gambalyan, Binance Head of Financial Compliance, was denied bail for the second time during his money laundering trial in Nigeria. Detained since February, the American citizen requested bail on medical grounds, claiming it required surgery outside the prison. 
and that his health was getting worse. However, Federal High Court Judge Imikan Biti ruled that there was no evidence to suggest the Nigerian Correctional Service couldn't manage Gambarian's medical needs. Additionally, the judge noted that Gambarian had not withdrawn an earlier appeal against a previous bill denial, calling the latest request an abuse of judicial process since the appeal was still pending. The trial was adjourned to October 18, following cross-examinations of two state witnesses. In Southern Africa, South Africa's tax authority announced that 21.4 billion rand, that's about $1.2 billion, had been paid out in six weeks since a pension reform allowing partial withdrawals took effect. The two-part pension policy aims to balance long-term retirement savings with flexibility for individuals facing financial hardship. The reform is expected to boost domestic demand and economic growth in late 2024. By September 11, just 10 days after the policy was implemented, 4.1 billion rand in withdrawals had been requested. The South African Revenue Service reported receiving around 1.2 million withdrawal applications, up significantly from 160,000 in early September. Under the reform, pension contributions are split, with one-third allocated to savings and two-thirds to retirement. And that's all on Business News. I am Likon Onobanjo. Business news in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. And in sports, Fisaya Dele Basiru, late strike, earns Nigeria late win against Libya in the 2025 AFCON qualifiers in Rio. Favor Itua has more updates. Sports Update, brought to you by Corn Oil. Corn Oil, we go. The extra mile. And in sport, Super Eagles midfielder Fisayo Dele Bashiro was the hero of the night when his 87th minute winner ensured Nigeria edged Libya 1-0 in a 2025 Africa Cup of Nations qualifying match in Uyuakwaibom. The Eagles had labored for almost all the match but could not find a way past the Libyan defense and goalkeeper Murad al Wuheshi. Ademola Lukman thought he had opened the scoring for Nigeria in the 83rd minute, but his goal was ruled out for an offside. The win keeps Nigeria top of Group D with seven points from their first three matches after Benin Republic walloped Rwanda 3-0. Nigeria travelled to Benghazi on Tuesday and another win almost guarantees a place at the 2025 tournament in Morocco. Away from the Super Eagles, Cameroon showed no mercy against Kenya as they beat the Arambi Stars 4-1 at the Japoma Stadium in Douala, Cameroon in their 2025 AFCON qualifier on Friday evening. Vison Abubakar opened the scoring as he converted the sport kick in the eighth minute. Marty Hongla doubled their lead in the 39th minute, and it seemed as though it would be a one way traffic. Kenya managed to pull a goal back through Michael Olunga in the 41st minute. Brian Mbuemo restored their two goal cushion in the dying minutes of the half to take a 3 1 lead. Cameroon continued to punish the visitors as Christian Basogog put them three goals ahead in the 55th minute, scoring the final goal of the encounter. The result sees Cameroon remain top of Group J standings with seven points after three games, two points ahead of second place Zimbabwe. 
And now to club football, Moroccan giant Raja Casablanca have appointed 52-year-old Portuguese manager Ricardo Sa Pinto as their new head coach. This marks Sa Pinto's first venture into African football, though he has a wealth of experience across Asia, Europe and South America. Notably, he managed Portuguese giant and his boyhood club Sporting Lisbon. His managerial resume also includes scenes in Cyprus, Turkey, Poland, Belgium, and Greece. He replaces Bosnian manager Rosmi Vigo, who was dismissed after just 64 days in charge following six matches. Vigo's tenure included two league defeats in five games, which ultimately led to his departure. And to wrap up sports update, American Coco Golf secured a 50th WTA win of the year with a 6-love, 6 4 victory over Magda Lynette in the Wuhan Open quarterfinals. The world number four will now face top seed Irona Zabalenka in the semifinals on Saturday after the U.S. Open champion beat Magdalena French 6-2, 6-2. The 20-year-old American made eight double faults against Poland's Lynette but was dominant on her opponent's serve, winning 14 of her 21 return points in the opening set. Meanwhile, two-time defending champion Zabalenka has steadied her unbeaten record in Wuhan to 15 matches. The Belarusian hit 42 winners in 16 games against French of Poland, securing victory in one hour and 23 minutes. And that wraps it up on Sports Update. And um, favor Itwa. Sports Update brought to you by Cornoil. Cornoil, we go the extra mile. Up next is entertainment. Entertainment news in association with Glow Unlimited. And now in entertainment tonight, Nigerian singer and songwriter Rema has been greeted with a heartwarming traditional welcome from his fans upon arrival in New Zealand. The global music sensation known for hit songs like Calm Down and Dumebi has been enjoying tremendous success and his fans in New Zealand made sure to showcase their excitement and admiration in a unique way. In a now viral video, Rema's arrival was met by fans dressed in traditional Maori outfits, performing captivating cultural dances to welcome the 23-year-old star. The highlight of the greeting was the hongi, a traditional Maori gesture where the participants press their noses and foreheads together to symbolize unity and respect. Rema, clearly moved by the warm reception, was all smiles as he graciously engaged with the welcoming crowd. This marks Rema's first ever performance in New Zealand and the anticipation for his show is high as fans eagerly await the electrifying energy he brings to the stage. On the international scene, American singer, songwriter and record producer T-Pain has surprised fans by dropping three brand new features across diverse genres, reminding everyone of his versatility. T-Pain took to Instagram writing, three new features out now. How you love that? Here's a rundown. Glorilla. I love her. T-Pain joins forces with rising rap star Glorilla on her latest track, I Love Her. Number two, Love You More. This one features Earth Gang in this soulful collaboration T-Pain partners with dynamic Atlanta duo Earth Gang on Love You More. And finally, collaboration with Pete and Bass called the T-Pain Remix. T-Pain also lends his voice to a remix of T-Pain by British hip-hop duo Pete and Bass. Known for their unique position in the rap world as two artists in their 70s, their witty and no-nonsense style mixes with T-Pain's legendary flair, resulting in a fun and unexpected banger. With these three features, T-Pain is once again proving his relevance and ability to connect with diverse artists and audiences. Entertainment news in association with Glow Unlimited. And that's all tonight, but before we go, another look at some of our top stories. We told you that the People's Democratic Party has denied appointing Yajari Mohammed as acting national chairman. Bielsa APC has suspended Lokobiri Leon, eight others over alleged anti-party activities. We also told you that President Bola Ahmed Tinubu and Vice President Kashim Shatima 
have consoled the NNPC boss over daughter's death. And finally, we told you that uh, Senegal's constitutional council has cleared Prime Minister Usman Sonko to run in parliamentary elections. You can watch News Central live across these platforms. DSTV Channel 422, Star Times Channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. And thanks for watching. I am Dakbo Adigbuye. Good night.